I am a sociocultural anthropologist and the doctoral candidate at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. My research concerns self-employed individuals, people who work for themselves, who can't really be considered entrepreneurs, and we'll talk about that shortly, who are not um, what the press calls gig workers, people like rideshare drivers, grocery delivery people, so on and so forth. Um, these are people that operate non-employer businesses in the United States. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so before I start talking about me, um, Ken should have asked you guys to read an article for this class did, um, by Karen Mylar called The Precarious Present. Did that actually happen? Did he assign that article? Did he? <laughs> did anybody actually read it? <laughs> well, all right. Um, I asked to have you guys read that article because in it, Karen Mylar talks about uh, catadores in Rio de Janeiro, who are people who climb over the garbage dump in Rio de Janeiro looking for recyclable refuse. And they collect that refuse and they get paid for it. It is a form of self-employment. The interesting thing about the Brazilian context is that in Brazil, um, as a matter of deliberate policy, about, oh, I guess 50 years ago or so, maybe longer, um, the president of Brazil instituted a set of policies to make the workers of Brazil the central category of citizenship for the country. So there was a minimum wage that was instituted. There were protective insurances that covered the workers, um, sort of the equivalent of workman's comp here, um, and disability insurance and things like that. Um, the workers got an official worker's ID if they had an employer. And um, it was sort of like a passport to citizenship. People who don't have those IDs are generally identified as undesirables. They're usually assumed to be involved in some kind of criminal behavior. Um, and in the favelas, in the um, slums, I guess, of Rio de Janeiro, they are often harassed by police. Um, the work that they do on the dumps is dangerous, it's nasty. Um, people frequently get hurt and killed by the uh, dump trucks that bring garbage to the dump. Um, it's smelly, it's, it's just all kinds of awful. But the people who work the dump, sometimes they get a regular job and they go off and they work that job. And a couple weeks, couple of months later, they're back on the dump. That's the interesting thing to me about this article. Why do you think they come back? I mean, it's a terrible job. Um, they don't have any kind of guaranteed wage working that job. Oops, sorry. And, um, 
you know, it's just a kind of nasty thing to do. They even, some of them, because the smell of working on the gum tends to pervade their clothes and even some of their skin, they have places that they go after they finish working so they can shower and perfume themselves so that their families don't know how they make their money because they're ashamed of it. But when they get jobs, they don't keep them very long. They come back to the doctor. Why do you think that is? No. <laughs> well, they don't because at the, the traditional job, they have a guaranteed wage. Um, they actually make more money with job. Any other idea why they might come back? Yeah? Okay, so we're not really talking about those kinds of jobs. We're talking about um, people who leave the dump because they got hired to um, clean somebody's house or do janitorial services somewhere. Okay, that is exactly it. Um, the workers, the catedores, told Dr. Mylar during her research that they cannot adapt to having a regular job. She tells a story of one woman named Rosa who got a job, she announced. I've got a job. The job that she got was cleaning somebody's house and she kept that job for about two weeks before she was back on the dump. And when Dr. Mylar asked her about it later, she said, they want me here until seven o'clock when I finish all my work by two. And to her, that just seemed ridiculous. And she had other stuff to do. She wanted to be home when her kids got home from school. So there's a kind of employment logic that says, I hire you to work for me from nine to five. That means I kind of own you from nine to five. And you have to be where I tell you to be, doing what I tell you to do from nine o'clock until five o'clock. And that is the employment contract that we enter into. And in exchange for that, I pay you a wage. Um, a lot of people like that kind of arrangement because it seems stable, because it's what they're used to. But for somebody like Rosa, who has kids that come home from school, and she can't afford daycare, who, you know, sometimes things happen to people. Um, remember I told you a few minutes ago that they get harassed a lot by the police. That means that there are these everyday emergencies that come up. Somebody got arrested, somebody got hurt for this dangerous job. And there are these things that come up that they aren't able to handle if they've got to be at a job from nine to five. Whereas if they're still on the dump, they can just go take care of it because there's nobody to say, well, you have to stay here. And because of the various precarities in their lives, that works better for them. So now we're going to return to the United States. In the United States, you, you read what people write about self-employment. You're usually hearing about entrepreneurs, people like Steve Jobs and Bill Gates, S.K. Barker, who start businesses 
and grow them to corporate behemoths. And for those of you who want to start businesses, those are the folks that you want to be when you grow up, right? Um, uh, multinational corporations earning you millions and billions of dollars a year. That's one category of self-employment. People who, and you know, you don't necessarily have to be Steve Jobs, but in mature capitalist economies, the assumption, tell me if I'm wrong, the assumption is that you start a business and you want to grow it. Would you agree with that? Start a business, you want it to grow. Then there's this other set of people who are getting more and more attention because as a category of non-employer businesses, they are growing and growing and growing. And these are particularly rideshare drivers, people who drive for Uber and Lyft. Um, there's going to be more of those every year. Um, they were making decent money early on, and then as they got bigger, Uber and Lyft both pulled back and started paying them not quite so well. Um, and now they're sort of, or at least, um, I don't know, I don't know if anybody's done any research on what percentage of that population is actually in activist mode and wants, you know, workers' rights and wants to be considered employees. Um, Lyft is interestingly silent, but Uber is saying, we can't make them employees because if we make them employees, then we have to start assigning them shifts, hours. Um, the courts said, Pooh, no, you don't. We don't accept that argument. So in California, for example, a law was just passed that defines independent contractors. Let's see if I can remember this. That defines independent contractors as people who work for you, where you control the work they do, where they are not up, where they are. Okay, I am, okay. They are not doing work that is core to your business. So if you hire an independent contractor, um, they're working for you, but they're not doing core work for you. And they don't have to work where you tell them to work. And they get to decide how much money they're making. Now, it so happens, when I first started doing my research on self-employment, and people started talking to me immediately about Uber drivers, and I thought about it for a while, and I said, no, Uber drivers are not who I'm trying to research. Not. They're independent contractors, aren't they? They're self-employed, right? They, well, no, they're not. Um, Rideshare drivers, when they drive, there are certain requirements, and I have driven for Lyft, I've never driven for Lyft, but there are certain requirements that they have that you're supposed to comply with when you've got passengers in the car. Um, for example, when you're driving for Lyft and you have passengers, you're not supposed to complain about traffic. <laughs> um, somebody does something really stupid and cuts you off or something like that, you can't yell at them when you have a passenger in your car if you're driving for Lyft. That's hard to do. <laughs> um, if you are driving for Lyft, you are supposed to go where the app tells you to go. So if the passenger says, I know a better way. You're supposed to tell them courteously that the app goes best. I don't do that either, but that's another story. Um, 
But the point of all this is that when you're driving for Lyft or Uber, what you are doing basically is following their instructions. You're constrained by the fact that you are supposed to be providing them with a branded experience that's somebody else's brand. So that's not independent. You don't get to decide how much money you make. When I first started driving for Lyft, I could pick somebody up from my neighborhood and take them to the airport, and that would be a $25 fare. Now, if I pick that same person up and take them to the airport, it's a $13 fare. Um, I didn't volunteer for that. Lyft gets to decide how much money I make. That's not independent either. Big thing for most of the people that drive for Lyft and Uber is I get to set my own hours. And that's important. People value their time. It matters to them. So, folks that I'm talking about are people who locate their own clients. Um, they have more than one client. Um, not even parallel to the way some people drive for Lyft and Uber, um, but most of the non-employer business owners that I talk to um, have two to five clients before they're at capacity, because there's only been so much to do, right? Um, They set their own hours, of course, but setting their own hours is kind of constrained by your client's hours, because you can work at 10 o'clock at night if you want to, but you can't call them. <laughs> um, that's not going to work. So, you get to decide what you're going to charge people. This is something that you know, by non-employer business owners worry about. After they've been doing it for a while, they stop worrying about it because they say, you know what, if you're not going to pay what I'm charging, then I'm not going to do business with you. Um, so non-employer business owners set their own prices, decide their own schedules, find their own clients, and usually have multiple income streams in that they almost never just work for one client. A lot of them, I heard somebody describe this as a meet and three. So you have a client who's your big client, that's your meet. And as long as you retain that client, you can pay the bills every month. And then there's the rest of what you do. Smaller jobs for different clients that are gravy. Um, these folks are largely invisible. I'm talking graphic designers, writers, um, programmers. I'm also talking about plumbers, electricians, landscapers. Um, has anybody here ever heard the term non-employer business before? No? Okay. That doesn't seem um, the U.S. Census Bureau measures non-employer businesses by looking at income tax returns. And they count you as a non-employer business if you have income from a Schedule C or from an 1120 if you're an S corporation or a C corporation or an LLC, any of the various um, forms of business. If you file those income tax returns where you have revenue, but you are not taking any deductions for payroll, then they count you as a non-employer business. Um, I like the term because it's really descriptive. Um, it's business, but it doesn't have any employees. That's easy. Um, it is better than using sole proprietorship, which a lot of people use, because sole proprietors can be sole proprietors and still have 20 or 50 or 200 employees. 
Um, so it's a sort of non-specific term. Same thing with self-employed. Everybody who owns a business is self-employed, no matter how big that business is. Unless you're a corporation and you know, put yourself on the payroll. Now, the thing about these businesses is they're hard to run because it's only one person. And that one person is everything from the janitor to the CEO. I've been talking to these folks for some time now and asking them, why do you do this? Why don't you just go find a regular job? Why do you do this? What do you think they tell me? If you were to start a business like this, why would you do it? For the money. So you would start a business like this if you thought you could make more money than you would working for somebody? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Be independent. Do not have to answer to somebody, you know, a boss or something like that. Um, anything else? Yeah. Okay. Control your own time. Now, when I talk to non-employer business owners, what they tell me, the number one word that they use is control. Um, they will, because when you are running your own non-employer business, you control everything. It's <laughs> not even just your time. Um, a lot of them talk to me about how they like being able to decide when they work, where they work, who they work with, and what kind of projects they take on. So they want to do interesting work they want to work with people who aren't jerks, and they want to set their own fees. And um, for some of them, and I think this is really interesting, for some of them, they can make more money, yes, working independently, because um, this is something that I have heard over and over and over again. Corporate America does not value creatives. So if you're a graphic designer or if you're a writer or some kind of creative something or other, and you go to work for corporate America, they're going to pay you crap. But if you come out of corporate America, step outside that corporate hierarchy, package yourself so that your value proposition becomes obvious to everybody, then you can charge twice as much as they would have paid you, three times, four times as much as they would have paid you. And they're willing to pay that partly because they can pay you a fee, not have to pay for your benefits, and um, so you're still cheaper for them than you would be if they hired you. So there's that. When you work these projects, well, you don't want to work with people who are jerks, right? Um, when you're a non-employer, you can fire your clients if you want to, if you don't like the way that they're treating you. Or if you determine after month one or month two that they're a slow payer and um, you're not willing to wait for them to pay you, That's something that you can't do. And think about that for a minute, because what that means is that when you're an unemployer business, let's say you're a programmer, and you go to company X, and you say, I'll write that program for you. And company X says, okay. 
and the non-employer business, you can say to that person, you know what? We agreed that this was how we we're going to work together and you're not complying with that agreement, so I'm out of here. You can say to that person, I'm not going to do any more work for you until you pay my last invoice. It changes the entire power dynamic between former employee and former employer. That's important. Um, it empowers workers in ways that probably weren't contemplated by Karl Marx. That's important. That's another aspect of this control that these non-employer business owners talk about. But one thing they almost never say to me is I'm doing this. They never say that. <laughs> um, they are making money, obviously. And I talk to non-employer business owners who make a couple million dollars a year. I've talked to non-employer business owners who make um, 125,000 a year. Talked to one lady. She's a career and life coach. She makes ninety thousand dollars a year working three days a week. Um, and then I talk to non-employer business owners who make 20,000 a year, 50,000 a year. When I talk to them, I ask them, do you want to make more money? And what they say to me, all of them, all of them, what they say to me is, well, I wouldn't say no to more money. But I don't want to do what I would have to do in order to increase my revenues. And that's another kind of thing. Um, this is a principle that I call sufficiency. Everybody in this room is familiar with sufficiency. Sufficiency is, a, is it starts as a sensual perception of enoughness. Okay. Sufficiency Efficiency is the perception that lets you know that you're tired and you need to go to bed. Efficiency is the perception that lets you know that was tasty, but I need to get up from the Thanksgiving dinner table. Efficiency is the perception that lets you know, you know, I'm working out, I'm loving the burn but I need to stop before I hurt myself. Efficiency is about enough. That contrasts, rather starkly I think, with, with the capitalist value for maximization. You're maximizing your revenues, you're maximizing your profits, you're maximizing your return on investment. And when you're maximizing everything you can, there's no such thing as enough, right? Um, this is what makes this particular group of workers, business owners, incomprehensible in the context of economics theory because they are willing to reach a certain point in earnings that supports their households and lifestyles to which they wish to become accustomed. And then they stop. They're like, okay, I'm, I'm making enough money. I don't need to make more. Every last one of them knows just what they would need to do to make more money but they're not interested. And this is kind of a bizarre thing to be saying in these United States of America, where we sort of have the reputation for being love with money. Um, this particular population is not, and I think that this idea is more widespread than this. 
I think that there are a lot of people in these United States. Um, they don't have anything against money. You know, if, um, if Bill Gates showed up at their front door and said, here, have some millions of dollars, they wouldn't turn that down. But there are other things in their lives to which they wish to devote time and attention and they're not willing to take the time and attention away from those other things in order to spend more time on their businesses increasing their revenues. To increase their revenues, what would they have to do? They would either have to charge more, which might price them out of the market, or they'd have to get more clients. Most of them, once they're well established, are at capacity when they've got about five, seven clients. So in order to increase the number of clients, they'd have to hire people, and they don't want to do that. Why not? They say they don't want to hire people because they don't want to have to manage people. They didn't like being managed. They don't want to have to manage people. The other thing is that usually whatever it is that they're doing, they really, really like it. They really love making those widgets. They don't want to have to stop making those widgets in order to run an organization. It's a different skill set. Um, it's just a different set of stuff that you have to be doing and caring about. So these folks get to a certain point in their revenues and that point, whatever it is, is, you know, is enough. They have specific tactics that they use to avoid growth. Okay. I had a conversation with a guy named Bernard Bell, who is the um, director of the entrepreneurship program in the economics department at UNC Chapel Hill. And he said to me, I don't believe that those folks who run those businesses deliberately stop their earnings at a certain point. I think if their businesses don't grow, it's because they can't, they don't know how. But he's wrong. Because they employ specific tactics to avoid growing beyond a certain point. They work fewer hours. They don't hire people. Um, They give away work. Um, contrary to what you may think about competitiveness among American businesses, these folks, they have their networks. If they can't or don't want to take a job, they will refer that potential client to somebody else. Maybe they know somebody who's just getting started and they need that client. And maybe you don't need that client. So you say, here, go work with them. They're, you know, they're good. Um, they also make choices about their time that have to do with other kinds of obligations. So I talked to a gal who um, is caring for an elderly mom who lives several states away. And whenever she needs to go deal with mom, she tells her clients, okay, I'm going to be out of town for a week or something. And um, she will either put their project on hold, she will give their project to somebody else in that particular field, um, and she will say, I'm not going to be available to you when I get back. 
And if they can't deal with that, they can fire her. She doesn't care because mom's more important to her. There are people who have young children. Um, who want to be able to care for their children in one way or another. Like the Catadores, children have no respect for clocks. They don't care that you're supposed to be working. Um, when I first got interested in this particular population, it was partly because I was one of them. I used to be a self-employed writer and publisher of an electronic newsletter. <coughs> Among other things, I was covering public policy and I was covering the economy. So I spent a certain amount of my time on the phone with staffers on Capitol Hill. But I worked out of my house. So that meant that I was able to call somebody and interview them on the phone and then get off the phone and go change the baby's diaper or go start a load of laundry. Clearly you can't do that in the office. So working this way allows you to integrate your life in a way that can't happen. Because when you have a job and you're there nine to five, theoretically, and then you're eight, you're supposed to put everything else in your life, out of your head, and just do your job for those eight hours, about well, seven hours, an hour for lunch, um, and you kind of have to be a machine to do this, really, because the fact of the matter is, if you're at work and somebody calls from your kid's school and says, the kid is sick, or they got hurt, or something happened, um, you know, you have to deal with that. But this kind of integration, sometimes it's deliberate, sometimes it's not. Sometimes, like I said, stuff happens and you gotta handle it. Um, sometimes you do it on purpose. I talked to a graphic artist who, you know, sometimes she'll be thinking about somebody's logo and thinking about different things she might try and she'll get up from her desk and she will go in the kitchen and make a pot of soup. And who knows how the unconscious creative mind works, right? Maybe she will see a shape among the noodles and the beans, who knows, that will make her think of something and then she will finish making her pot of soup and she will do the dishes and she will sit back down and it's clicking for her. Um, when I was publishing my newsletter, I was also writing my newsletter, sometimes, I'd get stuck. And more often than not, what would happen is I'd have all my facts, I'd have my interview, I'd know what the article was going to be about, but I had to decide what angle I was going to take to write about it. I knew what I was going to write, I just had to figure out how I was going to write about it. I cannot tell you how many games of free cell I played while I was working that out in the back of my head. So sometimes as we work, and you may know this just from writing papers, sometimes as you work, you kind of you get that paragraph written and then you're like, where do I go from here? and then you step back and maybe you play some solitaire. Maybe you get up from your desk and go take a shower. Maybe you eat a snack. But your brain is working through it in the back of your head. And then when you sit back down, refreshed, you can get back to work. You kind of can't do that 
in a traditional office. So there's control over how you work, who you work with, how much you make, and what kinds of projects you do. And people work self-employed for non-employer businesses because they care about their quality of life, because they care about the quality of the work that they do, and because they appreciate being able to allocate their time in ways that reflect their personal values. The real answer to the question, why do these people do this? Or maybe the better question would be, how do they do this? Ultimately, they're arranging their work to reflect their values. They're arranging their work to reflect the fact that their families or their hobbies, their avocations, um, mean more to them than making more money beyond a certain point. Um, They value being able to live their lives in ways that matter to them. And that brings a certain kind of humanity back to the actions that people, the economic actions that people take. Um, I kind of think this research on non-employers is the first proof, I think, that we have that people on a day-to-day -day basis, most people, I think, aren't necessarily interested in maximizing their revenues. You know, the lifestyles of the rich and famous might be fun, but ultimately, for most people, that's not what really matters. What really matters is the relationships that they have. What really matters is the communities they can build. And if making more money gets in the way of that stuff, then they're willing to not make more money. This fact has other impacts on them. But that's the bottom line. If you look at what they do on a day to day basis, most of them, in terms of daily practice, don't do anything different from what they would have done if they had been working for somebody else. They don't always work normal office hours, but clearly if they need to contact their clients, they're going to have to do that during regular business hours. Um, but they use sort of traditional workplace discipline that you'd expect to find in a construction company or in an office or whatever. They don't change that stuff. You know, they can tell you, I like having control over the way I work. But the way they work isn't really all that different from the way they'd be working if they had a traditional job. But it matters to them that they don't have to do the boring stuff, the uninteresting projects that they would have to do 25% of the time if they were working for somebody else. 
it matters to them that even though they're doing it the way they would have been doing it working for IBM they get control of that the other thing that Mylar talks about in her article is precarity precarity is an idea that is sort of the opposite of what mature capitalist economies used to be famous for. Um, there used to be lifetime employment, you know, 40 years, and then you retire with your gold watch and your pension. Um, that was my grandfather's. Um, that has become destabilized. Instead of defined benefit pensions, you have defined contributions. Um, instead of getting your health insurance paid for by your boss, you, they'll maybe pay for something. Um, there are fewer benefits involved in traditional employment as they have become more expensive. And as employers have found through the generations that they don't have to work as hard to get people to come work for them anymore. Um, but traditional jobs have become destabilized. People know that at any moment, through no fault of their own, they could get handed a pink slip. Maybe they're reorganized, maybe they're whatever. So in spite of the fact that as a non-employer business, you would think, wouldn't you, that non-employer businesses are less stable, more risky than traditional employment. One of the things that people say when they talk about why they don't start their own business, too risky. What if my business fails? Okay. But at this particular point, when you can get fired from your job, not because you did anything wrong, but just because of what's going on in corporate that you have no control over, you could lo lose your job any minute. Whereas when you're a non-employer business owner, you don't have that problem. Nobody can tell you you can't do this work anymore. Somebody might tell you, you can't do this work for me, but that's not going to stop you from going out and getting other clients. So what I have found, much to my astonishment, um, it takes some doing to get these businesses up and running to find that meet client <laughs> um, to get yourself established at a certain revenue level. But there really does come a point, usually about five or six years in, where people stop worrying about where their next client is going to come from. Um, they don't worry about it anymore. They have one or two or three regular repeat clients, and then they have however many other smaller projects that they do for however, however many other clients. They don't advertise. They don't need to because they get new clients through word of mouth, or referrals through their networks. And their revenues are actually more stable. They feel less precarious than their friends who have traditional jobs because they don't have to worry about getting laid off or liquidated as parents. Um, so, the system of independent work that I have been describing to you that nobody talks about, In some ways, it's much more advantageous for the worker. 
Um, what do you think? Is this a way of working that might become widespread? Is this a way of working that's going to stay very small? What do you think? Okay. Generational increase. Yeah. Well, and my kids are moment. And they tell me about how angry they are that all of the stuff that they were promised didn't materialize that, you know, as millennials, they were basically told, the world is yours. You're going to be a superstar. Everything's going to be great. And then they started coming out of school and having trouble finding jobs. Um, you have, you have jobs. Like when I was thousands upon thousands of years ago, when I was in my own, um, you could get a job as a secretary or a receptionist, the high school plum, or GED. Now, they want college graduates. They want people with a BA to sit behind a desk and say hi when somebody gets off the elevator. <laughs> um, there are a lot of reasons for that. But the point is that the bar keeps getting higher. Um, so being in the traditional workforce, being in the labor market that exists in the United States in 2019 is in some ways a lot more difficult than just doing it yourself. <coughs> Bless you. Um, it's a mixed bag like most things people do. In some ways it's harder, in some ways it's, it's, it's easier. So it's harder. You don't have access to workman's comp. You don't have somebody conveniently withholding income taxes from your pay. So that means that you have to pay attention to that and have money set aside. So when it's time to pay your taxes, you can do that. Because the government frowns upon that you don't. Um, those are the conveniences that you lose when you work for yourself. But again, many people think it's worth it. Um, any other points about what you folks as millennials think about this way of working? Yeah? I don't think it's really ever going to change because there's so many people now, like even our age, that are just like, influencers like on like social media or like youtubers and like they like a lot of youtubers i watch that are my age like they get their degree wherever they go and they'll, they'll never use it because they'll never make as much money as they're making on youtube with getting to just make videos and doing that like they're never gonna have a nine to five they're never gonna put their degree to use and it's like why would you <laughs> <laughs> so Am I hearing that as a generation, um, you guys don't really have a whole what do I want to put? Don't have a whole lot of faith in the system of getting the degree or whatever, and then going out and getting a job and doing the normal career trajectory. That's that's not gonna work for you guys, yeah? I don't know that it's about like faith. I think a lot of people look, see that there are easier ways to spend other than Well, yeah, how many people can do that though? So <laughs> really? Really they just post right videos now. of like the clothes they bought that day and they'll get like a million views like, or what they ate that day. Like, <laughs> <laughs> there's also children like unboxing. Right? You 
And brands just send them stuff. Like, they don't pay for it. So, <clears throat> if you had to, right this second, decide on your non traditional career, what would you do? I have a son who wants me to make um, YouTube videos about anthropology. <laughs> um, I told him I would let him interview me if he did the edits. We are negotiating that right now. Um, what would you do? Yeah. Do what kind of startup? Does it matter? Okay. Doing what? Oh, I see. I see some. So you want to work on something that fires your imagination. You want to work on something that matters to you. Okay. Anybody else? What do you want? To, what would you do if you could design your job yourself, doing anything that you think somebody might pay for? What would you do? I like kind of set aside ideas about like being a hooker or anything like that. <laughs> <laughs> Other than that. <laughs> I'll be cooking videos. Cooking videos. That'd be great. Yeah? I would have a, a, a farm that was a Animal rescue farm. That would be. Would you grow your food while you were there? <laughs> okay. Anybody else? Reviewing beauty products. What would you do after a while? That have like mountains of stuff that people sent me, which is like, okay, okay. Um, here's something that appeals to me particularly, just because I like the way it turns me on. A lot of administrative assistants who decide to go into will they will take themselves out of the corporate hierarchy where they're kind of low men on the totem pole and they will repackage themselves and their particular set of skills and they will come back to that corporate executive not as i will type your letters and get you coffee i will give you back your time is what they say I will give you back the time that you would have to spend doing this stuff. And all of a sudden, what those administrative assistants do becomes powerfully valuable. And I've seen them take their earnings and double them, triple them. Sometimes they end up making 10 times as much money as virtual assistants. Partly because they can charge more because of the way that they package them. And partly, once again, because they can work for more than one place. They can have more than one client. So if you put yourself together the right way, yeah, you could make more money. But from what I'm hearing, with pet rescue, with reviewing women's cosmetics, with doing a cooking show, is 
what I'm hearing people who want to do things that interest them, that might be fun, that might get them out of bed in the morning. So another thing that I think that we're finding out from these non-employer businesses is how people work best, how people want to be able to work. Um, Non-employer business ownership isn't particularly widespread. You're keeping roses and for everyone. And it's not for everyone, primarily because, at least here in the United States, we are educated to be employees. When you're in school, primary grades, secondary school, you learn a bunch of stuff. Okay, reading is useful. Math is useful, up to a certain point. Um, but you're learning much more important socially sanctioned skills. What does school teach you? It teaches you punctuality. You go to a room and you listen to the person and then the bell rings and you get up and you go to another room. I need to turn this off. Stop that. Um, the bell rings, you go to another room, you sit down, you listen to the next person talk. And you know, it's like Pavlov's dog. You know, the bell rings, you do what you're trying to do. Um, so it teaches you punctuality. It teaches you respect for authority figures. The teacher stands in the front of the room and tells you things and you are supposed to accept what you're told. If you're lucky, if you're really lucky, you'll have a teacher who will let you ask questions. And you come out of that experience of public education And, you know, whether or not it will ever matter to you in your life that might have been that uh, mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell, you will be able to keep a job because you will show up on time, you will do what your boss tells you to do, and you will apply your skills in the required fashion. That's what you learn in school. So we are educated to be employees. We are educated to step into a system and stay in that system for the rest of our lives. We are not educated to be independent. We are particularly not educated to be economically independent, design our own jobs. As I talk to non-employer business owners, I get that sense of people wanting what they do for most of their adult lives to mean something. And it doesn't necessarily have to mean something to the world if it means something to them. It's growing. When I first started looking at non-employer businesses, it was 1999. There's a data lag. So I was looking at numbers of non-employer businesses in 1997. That was when the Census Bureau first started um, counting non-employer businesses. At that time, there were, right, were 16.7 million of them in 1997. Now, According to the latest numbers, which we have, which are from 2007, so that's 20 years, there are 25.7 million of them. No, I'm sorry, 25.9 million. They're growing. 
um, it's actually been interesting to watch the numbers because they are now about 80, uh, 83% of all of the businesses in the country are non-employer businesses. There's another category of businesses that I look at, micro-businesses, fewer than five employees. Um, if you add non-employers with employer micro-businesses, you get 95% of all the businesses. Big businesses, humongous businesses. They don't even have to be all that human. Um, more than 500 employees. Less than 1% of all the businesses. And then the middle has been shrinking. Um, firms with between five and 499 employees have gone from about 12% of the business population to about 7%. Um, so, the middle is shrinking, those small businesses that the politicians love because they create jobs and make the politicians look good. Um, the businesses that are growing and behaving like businesses are supposed to, according to the economic sector, they're getting to be fewer and fewer. Part of the reason for that is technology. Technology has meant that a business can scale at a smaller size. And part of it is because there are plenty of people starting new businesses, but at least once again, according to those economic textbooks, they're not doing it right. They're not growing. They're not serving the economy. Um, as an anthropologist, one of my biggest issues with economics is this notion that people, particularly people in mature capitalist economies, are supposed to serve the economy. We're supposed to do things that will help in the efficiency of the economy. I actually had an economist tell me one day that people should be discouraged from running non-employer businesses because it's inefficient. And I said, but what if it makes them happy? And he said, but it's inefficient. Um, I think that People around us are coming to an understanding, perhaps instinctually, that we are not supposed to serve our economy. Our economy is supposed to serve. And that all of us as economic actors feel more comfortable. We are able to make a living in ways that jive with our personal values. That essentially is what these non-employer businesses do. So we have a few minutes left. Does anybody have any questions or comments that they want to offer? Yeah? I don't know. The academic job market sucks. Okay. <laughs> um, it, it's, so in the best of all possible worlds, I would get a tenure track position somewhere teaching anthropology and continue to do my research. Sadly, this is not the best of all possible worlds. Um, I could conceivably um, find work in a business school somewhere instead of an anthropology department, which might be nice because anthropology departments generally don't have much money and business schools generally do. Um, so I get paid better. Alternatively, I could see myself maybe starting a boutique anthropology shop and um, you know, doing 
user experience research or market research for large companies, and then I would be an unemployer business again. Um, so I have options. Um, I would prefer to research and teach, but we'll see. Thank you for asking. Any other questions? Okay, um, well, I am done. Um, this class is supposed to end at what, 11.20? Okay, so I'm letting you go like five minutes. Um, I'm here if you have any questions that you want to talk to me about. Thank you.